an amazing career. Comes an amazing collection. <laughs> at JR's Music Shops and Orange's Records and Tapes. Welcome to the I Am Vinyl Podcast. My name is Pete LaRussa, and I'd like to thank you for tuning in, whether it's here at cnjradio.com, or if you're viewing us on YouTube, or if you're subscribed via Apple Podcasts, or on Spotify, or any podcasting platform that we may be appearing on these days. I'm glad you're here and you can make some time for us as this is episode 40, which is a continuation of a series of roundtable discussions about my favorite band, KISS. And so we are following part five, which took place a few months ago, which was for Music from the Elder from 1981. And today's episode is going to focus on two records from 1982, first being the compilation Killers, followed by Creatures of the Night. And I'll get into more specifics about each album when I bring in the roundtable. But for now, just like in the last KISS roundtable discussion, I'm going to go over some various formats I own of each record on vinyl and on cassette and CD. So might as well just get it started right now before I bring in the roundtable. And we're going to start with Killers first. So the first edition that I have on vinyl for Killers is this one right here, which I picked up at a Sam Goody at a New Jersey mall with my cousin Joe sometime in 1989. And this is the original 1982 pressing from the Netherlands. It says on the back of the cover, printed in the Netherlands. And on the center ring label itself on the vinyl, it says made in Holland. And you may be wondering why the regular S's, why am I not seeing the lightning bolt S's that most KISS fans and even casual KISS fans are used to seeing? Simple explanation, any KISS releases that were printed in the Netherlands, sold in Germany, they could not have those lightning bolt S's because they bear too much of a resemblance to Nazi symbolism. It's pretty much as simple as that. So in case anybody was wondering why the regular S's, that's a, a simple and short reason right there. So as I said, I picked this up at Sam Goody in 1989. I was very excited because I had been aware of this album already, which I'll get into shortly. And so this is what the vinyl looks like. So you have the classic Casablanca Records and Filmworks label. So that is my first edition on vinyl that I own. Now let's see the second one that I picked up probably around a decade later. And here it is right here. This is a Japanese pressing of Killers. And like I said, I'll get into more specifics with the round table. There are different track sequences on the Japanese pressing that I'm holding here and the pressing from the Netherlands that I showed earlier. And also another difference between the Japanese pressing and the pressing that I showed earlier from the Netherlands is this Japanese pressing also comes with a lyric sheet and liner notes. Lyrics are in English. And then the back here, that's where you have all the Japanese text. And I have no idea what is on here. Show what the vinyl looks like. Okay, so here is the vinyl for the Japanese edition. 
very similar. Casablanca Records and Filmworks label. Just the, the text of the band name and title and the tracks are different. So as I mentioned earlier, I probably purchased this Japanese pressing about 10 years after I had purchased the pressing from the Netherlands. This one I had picked up near my old high school here in uh, Park Slope, Brooklyn. It was a place called Holy Cow. And I think it was a few years before they closed. I don't particularly remember when they closed, but I do remember going in there just by chance years after I had graduated from high school. And I found this with a bunch of other original Kiss records that I ended up picking up. I think this was like only a dollar or two. It was really, really cheap. And I'll get into another one shortly that was also found at the very same store. But for now, let's get to the next vinyl pressing that I currently own for Killers. So this next one is a double pressing that was actually delivered to me a few months ago this year, back in June. And it is the latest import double LP pink vinyl pressing that was released overseas by Universal Music. As you could see here, once again, you don't have the lightning bolt S's. And on the back of the album cover, it does say distributed by Universal Music Germany. And just another note, this is probably the best sounding pressing that I own out of the three pressings that I own of Killers with the 45 half speed mastering. The newer tracks that were recorded specifically for this compilation, they sound better than I've ever heard them on vinyl. And I'm not going to display the contents in hand, but however, I am going to share my screen and I'm going to show you the album. The day I opened it here on June 29th. So you could see in this picture here, you could see the two labels per disc and the variations of the Casablanca Records and Filmworks label. One primarily black and silver, and then on the second LP, primarily silver and black. And this is a half speed remaster, pink transparent vinyl, as you see here, strictly limited, number 3,938 of 4,000 pressed. It's at 45 RPM, foil gatefold album cover, comes with a foil sticker and booklet. And so you can see all that stuff right here. So you get the foil sticker and the booklet, number 3,938. And you see my other editions, the vinyl that I just showed. And you'll see coming up next here. Okay, so now I've shown the vinyl. Now I will show the actual first edition that I became very familiar with. And it was the original cassette. And I think this was my cousin Joe's. So I think he, he gave this to me sometime, probably around 20 years ago. So this is the European edition on cassette. I remember borrowing this from him before I got the vinyl. So I definitely got in a lot of listening on this one before I ended up finally buying my own vinyl copy. And years later, in the early 90s, we had a place here called Caesars Bay Bazaar a long time ago. And it was basically just like a big mall, just full of different shops. And they had a couple of music shops. And one of the music shops was the type of thing where if you wanted to order an import CD or something, you could ask them to order it for you. And you'd wait around a month to two months. And then they would give you a call and say, hey, your CD showed up or your cassette or whatever you decided to order. So when I started collecting CDs and I had collected all of the Kiss albums up to that point, probably, this is probably 1993. So they were probably up to Kiss Alive 3 at this point. So I thought to myself, well, I have a, a hole in my CD collection because I don't have killers. And so I asked the guy who worked at one of the record shops he had like a cart, actually. He had, he had a cart. It was, it was upstairs in Caesars Bay. And so he had this cart, had a bunch of bootleg tapes and you know regular standard cassettes you could buy in any store and CDs and some vinyl. 
So I asked him if he could order me Kiss Killers on CD. And within like a few minutes, he said, oh yeah, I could definitely order that for you. And he could leave me a deposit and he wrote me a little receipt basically just as a guarantee that when it arrives, he'll call me. Actually, I think I, I paid for it all up in front. So, and yeah, sure enough, about a month or so later, I got my Kiss Killer CD. So uh, as you can imagine back then, I was pretty thrilled. So that covers the formats that I own of Killers. Let's move right ahead to Creatures of the Night. So immediately we'll start with the original pressing right here. And I believe I picked this up at a KISS convention in New Jersey. I'm going to say 1995 or 1996. It was definitely one of those years. And I was really, really excited because I had never owned the vinyl with the original cover. I had the vinyl with the reissued cover from 1985, which I'm going to get into shortly. But this is, again, the original pressing of Creatures of the Night. Certainly has seen better days as far as the album cover and the inner sleeve, but overall not too terrible. And like I said, this was 1995. I wasn't even 20 years old yet. So I was just excited to have an original pressing of Creatures of the Night. Didn't have a lot of money. So even if I wanted to get one, in mint condition, probably was out of my price range at that point. So still sounds great. So I, I really have no complaints. So let's get to the, the next one. The next one is a pressing I acquired not too many years ago, about three years ago. And it's another one here with the original album cover. Only, ooh, it's a gatefold. So some of you might be wondering, what is this version of Creatures of the Night? I know a lot of KISS fans are aware which one this is, but for some that may not even be aware, this is one of the editions released in 1995. And this one glows in the dark. So when you play it on your turntable, it does have some surface noise. But overall, it doesn't sound too bad. And most KISS fans know already that this isn't the original 1982 version that is on this vinyl, but actually it's the 1985 remix that was somehow pressed onto this vinyl. And for some reason, it's just like the CD version of that 85 mix. The end of Danger fades a little quicker than usual. But good collector's piece to have, I would say but not something you would want as an audiophile. So moving ahead from the 1995 Glow in the Dark edition of Creatures is the 2014 180 gram remaster reissue of Creatures of the Night. So once again with the blue album cover and again, you get a nice replication of the original sleeve. However, it does not have the same exact liner notes. The first edition, it says lead guitar, Ace Frehley and Vinnie Vincent. This one doesn't even say it at all. So this is what the vinyl looks like. Very nice remaster. The only drawback is once again, Strangely, even though it has the original 1982 album cover art, it does not have the original 1982 mix. Immediately you know it because of the first song, Creatures of the Night, and the way it ends. Lifelong KISS fans know what I'm talking about. The endings are different for the original and the 1985 mix. So it's immediately apparent that they used the 1985 mix either for just that track or for this entire thing. and kept the same track order from 1982. So sounds great though. This is a, a really good remaster if you can just bypass the fact that you're not getting the original 1982 mix of the title track. So let's move on. 
Finally, in terms of Creatures of the Night on vinyl, I had mentioned it a little earlier. I had alluded to it. It is the 1985 reissue and remix reshuffling of some tracks. So this is the reissue of Creatures of the Night. As you can see, Bruce Kulik appears on the album cover. Obviously, to most lifelong KISS fans, they are aware that Bruce Kulick did not play on this record, although he is on the album cover. Would have been impossible since he wasn't in the band in 1982 and this was released in 1985. For some reason, they felt they had to issue this with a new album cover and remixing certain tracks like Creatures of the Night and reshuffling some tracks. This is actually the very first of anything that I ever owned for Creatures of the Night. However, this isn't my first copy. I don't know what happened to my first copy. My mom bought it for me in 1985, soon after it came out at Record Factory. But I, I lost it over the years. And 1999 rolls along, and I'm in that store that I mentioned before called Holy Cow. And here it was for a buck. Obviously, a little bit of ring wear. It's obviously seen some better days. But once again, I, I really can't complain about the vinyl. And speaking of which, here is the sleeve. The sleeve's actually in pretty nice shape, considering much nicer than my original pressing of Creatures of the Night. And there is the record. As you can see, by this point, yes, they were on Mercury Records. So when it was reissued, it was given the Mercury Records black, orange, and gold label for the time with the silver text. So that was the vinyl for Creatures of the Night. And I'll just get into some other formats that I currently own. Some years back, I was able to find the original cassette. This one, I don't really recall where I found it, but it was either somebody found it for me or I found it in a store. I, I'm leaning towards somebody found this for me and gave it to me. So this might've been my cousin, Joe. So if he's watching this, maybe he remembers. So whoever it was, thank you. So that's the original Creatures cassette. Still sounds great from the last time I remember listening to it. This is the 1985 reissue on CD. This is the very first CD of Creatures of the Night that I ever purchased sometime in 1990 or 1991. And finally, the 1997 remaster of Creatures of the Night on CD, which I was highly anticipating because they were bringing back the original album cover art with the original track listing and sequence and the original 1982 mixes, which makes it even strange as to why that mix is not on the 2014 180 gram vinyl remaster that I had just shown a little earlier. But that's the way it is, I guess. So without any further ado, I think it's time to bring in the round table. So let's bring in the guys right now. All right, welcome everybody to part six of the I Am Vinyl podcast roundtable and talking about my favorite band, Kiss. As I said in the introduction, we are picking up where we left off with part five, which we covered music from the elder. And with this episode, we are covering killers and creatures of the night. So it's going to go around the roundtable here and just introduce everybody really quick. So we have Ron Valdez once again. What up, y'all? We have my brother, Vincent LaRussa, joining us again. What's up? We have Joe Malazzo joining us again. What's up, guys? And finally, we have a newcomer to the round table. <clears throat> so let's welcome Steve Malone to the I Am Vinyl podcast and the KISS roundtable Hello. discussions. Welcome, oh, Steve. Hello, Steve. everyone. Thank you. I was, I was told you, by you. a reliable source. Well, he, he really likes Creatures of the Night. He's a big fan. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Jay Leno? Yeah. Jay Leno? Uh, my Uncle Jay. <laughs> yes. yes, it's true. Yes, yes it's very true. I, oh, I am a very big fan. I was talking about Jay Leno fan. or that you're a big fan of Creatures yes. of the Night? <laughs> yes, okay. both. Both. Okay. Well, again, welcome, Steve, to the roundtable discussions. And Excellent just going to get everything moving now. So as I said, we're going to start off with the compilation first that was released 
on June 15th, 1982. And I am talking about Killers. And specifically, the four newer tracks that were recorded for Killers. And they were recorded at the record plant in Los Angeles, spring 1982. These new tracks were produced by Michael James Jackson with Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons. The cover design was by Howard Marks Advertising. The cover photography by Barry Levine. There were no official singles released from Killers. And like Kiss albums discussed previously, there are some ghost musicians on the new tracks specifically that I'm talking about here. So you have Michael, or is it Mikkel? I think it's Michael Jap, rhythm guitar on Down on Your Knees. And a name that I've mentioned before, Bob Kulik. He plays lead guitar on all four tracks. I'm a legend tonight, Down on Your Knees, Nowhere to Run, Partners in Crime. And I mentioned in the introduction when I was showing the German and Japanese pressings of Killers, the Japanese version of Killers added two more tracks that were not on the standard edition. Escape from the Island, which was not included on the Japanese version of Music from the Elder, and Shandy. Talk to Me, along with Shandy, were also added to the Australian release of Killers. So there are also some alternate mixes and edits included on this compilation. Shout It Out Loud is the original single mix. Detroit Rock City, no full intro. It fades in just before the opening guitar riff. God of Thunder has no intro. And I Was Made for Loving You is the original single mix. So as I did mention the new tracks earlier. So the new tracks, as far as the songwriters, I'm a Legend Tonight was written by Paul Stanley and Adam Mitchell. Down on Your Knees was written by Paul Stanley, Michael Jap, and Brian Adams. Nowhere to Run was written by Paul Stanley. Partners in Crime was written by Paul Stanley and Adam Mitchell. And just some additional background information before we move forward. Since they'd signed a new multi-year, multi-million dollar European album contract with Phonogram to begin the 80s, following Neil Bogart selling off Casablanca Records to its distributor, Polygram Records, and Unmasked and Music from the Elder did not live up to sales expectations while the band's popularity was waning fast, especially here in the U.S., Kiss were asked to record four new tracks for this compilation by Phonogram. Specifically, tracks that were more in line with what they had promised to record following the release and reception to Unmasked, and especially after the disastrous results and reception worldwide to music from The Elder. So those are the, the bullet points on Killers. And now I am going to go around the room and get your thoughts on the brand new tracks that were recorded for Killers. And let's start with the new guy first. So Steve. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, no pressure. We'll yeah. just throw it right in. Throw just me right in the fire. Throw you right into the fire. All right, cool. Well, um, well, I went back and I re-listened to it. It's been a long time since I heard those four cuts in particular. And then I also grabbed my trusty Behind the Mask book so I could kind of have some sort of, you know, following along to find out what the story was behind it. But my initial takeaway from those four tracks were that it really did seem like desperation in the band. Like they needed to make some sort of turn in their trajectory. The Elder was a flop, as we all know. It was a weird left, hard left turn. So they really needed to go back to some roots. And I feel, I feel like Killers is a killer demo to what would become Creatures. I mean, you have all the same cast of characters, really, between the two Creatures and, and Killers, including Michael James Jackson, who's mm -hmm. behind the board. The difference between Creatures and Killers for me was Sonics. And sonically, I felt like on certain songs, like uh, I'm a Legend Tonight, kind of had like a dynasty sound to it. Kind of had a real muted, dry drum sound, which was the opposite of what we would hear on Creatures with Eric Carr's, I mean, iconic sound on Creatures, the bombastic bigness. I'm a drummer, first and foremost. So when I listen to music, I listen from the bottom up. So my analytics is all mostly starts from the drumming. So that's what I hear first. So it, it, to me, I heard a lot of dynasty sounding drums on Killers with the exception of Down on Your Knees. I thought that kind of had like a, the sonics of what would become Killers. Really nothing for me to, to take home. I, nothing that I would, I, I'm 
dying to go listen to over and over again. Maybe Nowhere to Run because I'm a big Paul Stanley guy. And that, to me, that sounds a little, like a, like that could have fit on his 78 solo album, which I love. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, besides Ace, I mean, that Paul Stanley 78 album is just the best. What were your feelings on Music from the Elder? You mentioned that it felt forced. Yeah. That they had to do Killers. What Since you weren't a part of the roundtable for Music from the mm-hmm. Elder, was that an album that you felt was a major misstep for Kiss to your ears, or were you actually uh, in favor of that one? Definitely to my ears, it was a big question mark in their catalog. It was a, okay, they really wanted to be artsy musicians, and they veered away from the rock and roll, and they went into the long form. They went into the concept. Cool. It works for some bands. It did not work for Kiss there. So for me, the takeaway is that The Elder was a flop. But the positive that comes from that was that they knew it was a flop. They knew it was a problem. They were able to make an album like Killers, and I might be you know, going a little too far ahead. It is my favorite Kiss album. And it is, to me, the hardest rocking album to that point. You'll have Revenge down the line, which is arguably, you know, could be considered heavier. But up to that point, it's Creatures of the, of the Night is their heaviest hard rocking album. So I gravitate towards that. Go back a little bit, being a, a drummer, as I mentioned, that was Eric Carr's, uh, the elder I'm speaking about, that was Eric Carr's first foray into recording an album with Kiss. and. Up to that, you know, you're, you're led to believe that Eric Carr is going to be this double bass, you know, killer. Look at that drum kit. It's got a friggin', you know, tank on there. He's going to be a friggin' god back there. And he's playing orchestral music. <laughs> it was kind of a letdown, you know. But fast forward, you, the payoff is Creatures of the Night. And again, being the, a drummer, to me, Eric Carr is the unsung hero of that album. But I'll stop there. Okay. Well, I'm going to go to Joe now. And what do you think, Joe, as far as the the newer tracks on Killers? We don't really have to talk about the compilation in itself. You know, we we know it's basically a hits compilation with with some new tracks. I mainly want to focus on the newer tracks. So, yeah, that's all I focused on. I didn't pay attention at all to what tracks, you know, ignore. I ignored them pretty much because this is kind of like a I guess it was a showcase to try and get them to record some newer, some heavier songs, try and get them back into the popular consciousness of like, hey, Kiss is still this like heavy rocking band and here's some new songs and plus some old ones. Like, I think that was the thinking of what record company were they with at that point? Was it Mercury or? And I think they were signed with uh, with Phonogram. This was a, originally a European compilation. So oh, it's it wasn't only European. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't officially right. released in the United States. So people here had to get it as an import back then. Right, right, right. Which I was I was going to get into in a little while. As far as I know, like it's what I mentioned in the in the notes earlier, they they had signed a European deal. And I guess when they they signed that European deal and Neil Bogart had sold off Casablanca, they made this deal with Phonogram and so it was still released on Casablanca Records overseas, oh, really? but just in imprint only because Casablanca Records was, was, was sold off. So basically they were with Phonogram Polygram. In the United okay. States, in the United States, they signed with Mercury Records out of that Phonogram Polygram deal. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to do- get okay. into the weeds about the record label stuff. Basically, I think that was the impetus to create this you know, these songs to me, they're just kind of like, there's like a half-ass quality to it. I'm, you know, I'm hearing more. What did this come out in, 81? June 15th, June, 1982. June, yeah. June 15th, 1982. Okay. I'm just hearing more like radio rock to me. I'm, I'm hearing like shades of, uh, I, I feel like there's riffs out of like Beat It, Michael Jackson, that like, dun, 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 dun. I feel like, I don't know, there's like, well, the, like it, sur- when did, when did Thriller come out though? Was it before or after this? Around the same time. I wow. think it was definitely yeah. 82. I know it was, yeah, it was 82, right? But yeah, it wasn't one before the other. 
But that's 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 funny that you mentioned that that is the, the similarities to it. I never heard anybody say that before. Well, yeah, and uh, uh, I'm a legend that, tonight. That guitar riff is super re reminiscent of the uh, the beat it uh, guitar like there. I don't know. I just feel like this is like a radio like Rick Springfield Survivor type that kind of rock. You know, it's like tepid. It, you know, these there's some interesting ideas. I'm a legend tonight is like this bombastic. I mean, what a what a thing to say to a chick you're about to bed. I'm gonna be a legend tonight. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, man. I think that song is okay. You know, the other ones, uh, partner in crime. I, my notes for that just said lazy. <laughs> just nothing, nothing mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Nowhere to run kind of has an interest you know kind of a cool chorus i'm hearing shades of a little bit of paul's solo record on there there's like a quiet sure. slower part it kind of reminds me of uh tonight i belong to you mm -hmm. and it's also that the riff in nowhere to run kind of sounds like uh thrills of the night Good so point. it's almost it have a little of a similarity again a first time i ever heard it's, anybody say that before Interesting. it's super they're super close mm -hmm. So it's almost like one foot back, one foot forward with that song. There's some, you know, like glimmers of, oh, there's something cool here. Down on your knees. No, not into it. <laughs> it's like corny. I guess it's like the, fun in its own way, but, it's, you know, these, these are like, I would not, a uh, first time, a kiss newbie, I would not, I would steer them pretty clear from these songs, you know. This would be like bottom of the barrel, but. Like, so you like, like it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In essence, I love this. Ten, <laughs> ten stars. <laughs> it's like a demo of these, this rough idea of where they're going to go. But it's like, whereas creatures, I feel like they planted their feet firmly in, all right, this is Kiss as a modern heavy metal band. Mm -hmm. I think this might be the, that, you know, not to jump ahead too much, but I think Creatures is the first time where in their mind, they're like, we're going to make a heavy metal record. Whereas with this, I don't think they were there yet. I think they were just short of it, you know, so. It's funny that you mentioned Beat It, because uh, in reading this book, Bob Kulik had a quote that uh, Paul and Gene were pushing him to sound like Eddie Van Halen and Randy Rhodes. How does this stack up against Eddie? How does this stack up against Randy? So at the time, they, you know, the, the, the two mainstays, they were pushing to get that sound. And Bob did not have a good time recording those tracks at no, all. No, no, he did not. No, apparently not. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was really that at that point, he had done the ghost tracks on Alive 2 and, you know, anything else. And he was just like, I'm fucking tired of you asking me to play like either Ace Frehley or now fucking Randy Rhodes and Eddie Van Halen. Like, yeah. can't you just can't you just sound like kiss <laughs> so didn't, he, didn't he say something like that but either way he, he was not happy during that re particular recording session no i'm gonna move on to ron i'm gonna ask you a similar question that i would ask my brother because you guys were, were buying records around that time so when did you first hear or see killers and did you buy it back then on, on vinyl or cassette or whichever I did not. My friend Charlie Bagarosa, nice. Rest in peace. He bought it. I recorded it off his, you know, tape or whatever. I think he might have had the cassette and I just dubbed it, you know. To me, this is like Kiss embracing the 80s because their first foray into the 80s was, you know, the elder. <laughs> that uh, <laughs> didn't work out too well. So they said, you know what? Let's embrace the 80s. That's, Even a, like the, that's a kiss in the Middle Ages. <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> right. To, to some, the 1680s to some or something. <laughs> Music from the Middle Ages. <laughs> right, yeah, right. 1480. Um, so, like, even the graphic design, I, you know, because I what I do for a living, like, I noticed the cover is, like, neon colors, and it's just got this stupid 80s font that's killers and, you know, the Kiss logo. I'm a legend tonight. When I hear that song, what I think of is a montage in the Karate Kid. It does like, it does sound like a very montage. Like you, right. Fest like of that the is 80s like, movies. you know, someone training to do something very sporty. Yep. That's why I said Survivor, because maybe right, I was yeah, thinking totally. of Rocky. Good call. But it has 100%. that. 
<laughs> yeah, man, it has that total. T- it has that total flavor to it. Uh, the only song of these four I feel that is that gains any respect for me is "Nowhere to Run" because, like you guys said, that's like a Paul Stanley. If this, if that song would have been on Creatures, it would have been viewed differently, I think, or any other album that came after that. Like if it, if it would have been on, it could have been on Asylum, and it would have been a well, a more well accepted Kiss tune, I think. The other two are just throwaway tracks. There's nothing redeeming about Partners in Crime and Down on Your Knees is just a bore. But I'm a legend tonight as far as it stands. Like I said, you know, like it, it, it would sound great in an 80s movie as, uh, as a montage background piece. And not wrong with that. I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of cool montage pieces with cool tunes. And, you know, that could that if I would have seen that in Rocky Four, I would have been like, yes, you're a legend tonight, Rocky. You know, like, yes, Rock. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't have been so bad and it wouldn't have been so bad but uh yeah nowhere to run is definitely the standout track here but it doesn't really stand out you know this was like we're all saying this was the big setup right this was the big setup of vinnie vincent to come save kiss right <laughs> i mean yeah the uh, age-old question did vinnie vincent it, save it, kiss? it's it's an age-old question but the answer is yes bro if, if 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 we're gonna we're gonna look at it that way, we're not gonna talk about that yet because we still have lick it up to get to that point. He did a lot of stuff, and and I think that he pointed them towards this direction. And we'll talk about creatures later, but whatever. The age old question always lives on. All right, depends on what kind of fan you are, you know. That's the truth. Okay, Vin. Same type of question. You know, I somewhat remember when. You got Killers. I think you first got it on vinyl. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, so the interesting thing is I just looked at the sticker on there, and it says Target. Now, I could tell you, and it says seven ninety nine. Wow. There was no Target back then, or of, of what we know today is to be Target. So I have, I thought I got this at, like, Record Factory, like on 86th Street, but clearly mm, it says weird. Target. Yeah, and, and uh, trust me, my brother knows I got this back in the 80s. Yeah, it's, not, it's a generic name. It, it, there could have been a, there's some department store called some low, you know, yeah. unknown department store called Target at the time. Yeah. Wait, which which it's edition is cool. that? Which pressing is that? Because I, I noticed you I have know? the you have the regular lightning bolt S's. It's not the uh, the German with the regular S's. Is that the Japanese one? It says phonogram. You know, made in Holland. Holland. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So maybe Target was a store in Holland or something. Could be. I mean, could be. Could be. Yeah, you might have bought it as an import at one of the record stores, right. but it just well, had. Well, I can tell you this. I saw it in the store, and I was like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> that was my reaction. I was like, "I think the first time I ever saw the record was when you bought it, because I probably reacted yeah. the same way as a little kid, like, oh yeah. my god, what is that?'" <laughs> right. Exactly. And you know, looking on the back, I was like, "Oh yeah, I know a lot of these songs, but what are these other four songs?" You know, and yeah. clearly, I knew it was a it was an import because I because I could just. You know, when I saw marketed by phonogram and, you know, I kind of knew about the whole uh, cast playing. Remember, this is this is before the age of the Internet and we could look this stuff up. We had no idea where these songs came from or anything like that. I kind of feel the same, like nowhere, where, nowhere to run is definitely the standout track. And even more so, and I may have mentioned this before, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself. When I saw Bruce Kulick play with Bob Kulick and Ace Frehley and Eric Singer at the Indie convention i don't know three years ago and they performed this live it was like unbelievable like it's one it's a different thing when you hear something on record and you think oh yeah this is kind of a cool song and then you hear a song that kiss has never performed live and then you hear it it just sounds that much better i think i may have said it the last time or maybe i said it when i did the podcast with my friend mike like burn bitch burn was never a good song in my opinion yeah, you however said when this, you said that on yeah the last when one, i man. heard it live i was like wow this song's kicking ass like you know it was it had like a totally <laughs> different feel but I definitely feel like, and I think it might have been Joe who said that it's, it sounded like they were going for this ra- rock uh, radio oriented, whatever they call that, R, you know, rock oriented A-O-R. radio. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Arena yeah. oriented rock. Yeah. Right? And it definitely has that, that commercial sound. I do agree. Like partners in crime should, should have just been called like, you know, partners in crap or something like that, because <laughs> I think the song is just fucking terrible, you know? It's, yeah, exactly. You know, so I'm a legend tonight. I, I think it's the second best song on there. And, you know, but otherwise, I think it's interesting to know that, you know, the Brian Adams connection before War Machine, yeah. you know, that's kind of cool, you know, and 
and even back then, when I got the record, I remember seeing like Brian Adams and knowing already at that point, I think Summer 69, all those hits he had, and just thinking, being very confused, is like, what the hell was Brian Adams doing work with Kiss? Like, you know, I so, thought too. Yeah, but hey, um, I don't, th this doesn't, to me, these songs don't sound like they belong on Creatures of the Night to me. And it's not just a production thing, it's more of the attitude of the tunes too, you know what I mean, I think? And certainly not the elder by far, but I do think it is like a bridge too. Like, I mean, think about again, sonically these songs as compared to unmasked, you know, I think it's definitely got a much better edge and I'm actually like, I think I'm maybe one of the few who like unmasked for certain reasons. I definitely think it's, it, somebody said it was a bridge to what would become creatures of the night. Okay. I think it's pretty easy to pick the overall favorite track. And is really one because everybody said it, and I have to agree. Nowhere to run is the best out of the four tracks from Killers. My second favorite would be "I'm a Legend Tonight," and I agree with everybody here. "Partners in Crime" and "Down on Your Knees" are definitely the weakest. Like those songs could could definitely go away, but "Nowhere to Run" I think should be the collective pick. So why don't we play that track right now? All right, that was Nowhere to Run from my first edition of Kiss Killers. And now it's time to move on to the album that followed and was released on October 28th, 1982. And of course, we're talking about Creatures of the Night. And this was also recorded at the record plant in Los Angeles. And this album was recorded between July and September of 1982. Once again, just like the new tracks on Killers, this was produced by Michael James Jackson, along with Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons. Cover photography was by Bernard Vidal, and the design was from Howard Marks Advertising. The singles released, I Love It Loud, released October 13th, 1982. And there was a single for Killer released only in the UK in November of 1982. And a single for Creatures of the Night, released only in the UK in April of 1983. As far as videos are concerned, this is one of the first studio albums by Kiss that actually had an official music video that was aired on MTV. I believe this was the first one that probably aired on MTV, and it was for I Love It Loud. And there are two different versions of this video, one with an extended introduction and one without. And interestingly, the version with the extended introduction is included on the Kiss Gold CD DVD compilation set, whereas most releases that have included the video have used the more commonly seen shorter version on MTV's Headbangers Ball in the late 80s and early 90s without the extended introduction. As far as the chart positions are concerned, Creatures of the Night peaked at number 45 on the Billboard Top 200 Albums chart and number 22 on the UK Albums chart in comparison. I Love It Loud as a single peaked at number 22 on the Billboard Mainstream Rock Tracks chart, and Creatures of the Night peaked at number 34 on the UK Pop Singles chart. As far as certification status, Creatures of the Night was certified gold on May 9th, 1994, with over 500,000 copies sold. As I mentioned and showed in my introduction, the album was reissued in 1985 in late spring, early summer of 1985. The title track, Creatures of the Night, along with I Love It Loud and War Machine were remixed by Dave Whitman, with Eric Carr also said to have been involved. And the track sequence on this reissue is different than what is found on the original release of the album as Saint and Sinner and Killer switch sides. So they basically flip-flop on sides A and B. And as far as the tracks and the respective songwriters, Creatures of the Night, was written by Paul Stanley with Adam Mitchell. Saint and Sinner, which is actually track number eight on the 1985 reissue, was written by Gene Simmons and Michael Jap. Keep Me Coming was written by Paul Stanley and Adam Mitchell. Rock and Roll Hell was written by Gene Simmons, Brian Adams, and Jim Valance. And this song was also originally recorded by BTO, Bachman Turner Overdrive, on their 1979 album, Rock and Roll Nights which featured other tracks written by Jim Valance. Danger 
was written by Paul Stanley with Adam Mitchell. I Love It Loud was written by Gene Simmons with Vinnie Vincent. I Still Love You was written by Paul Stanley with Vinnie Vincent. Killer, which is track number two on the 1985 reissue, was written by Gene Simmons and Vinnie Vincent. And finally, War Machine was written by Gene Simmons, Brian Adams, and Jim Valance. So as I mentioned with Killers, and as we've mentioned on some previous Kiss albums, once again, we have those additional ghost musicians. This album probably has the most, I would say, at least the most in terms of lead guitar players. So going down the list, we have Vinnie Vincent. He plays lead guitar on Satan Sinner, Keep Me Coming, Danger, I Love It Loud, Killer, and War Machine. Robin Ford, a friend of producer Michael James Jackson, he plays lead guitar on Rock and Roll Hell and I Still Love You. Steve Ferris from Mr. Mister, he plays lead guitar on Creatures of the Night. Jimmy Haslip, former member of Blackjack with Bruce Kulick and Michael Bolton, he plays bass on Danger. Mike Porcoro from Toto, he plays bass on Creatures of the Night. And finally, Adam Mitchell plays some additional guitars on Creatures of the Night. Some more additional background information. Of course, longtime KISS fans know Ace Frehley is pictured and credited on the album cover, on the original album cover and the liner notes. And although some have claimed tapes may exist with him participating in the recording sessions, nothing has yet to surface. Gene Simmons plays rhythm guitar on Killer and War Machine. Eric Carr plays bass on I Still Love You. The only track to feature all four members of what would become the touring lineup for Creatures of the Night with Vinnie Vincent replacing Ace Frehley following his departure from the band is Keep Me Coming. And credit goes to Joey Haney for that reminder a short while back. And this would become the first Kiss album to feature only Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons as primary vocalists on the entire album. So with that now, I turn it over to the round table. And I'm going to start with Ron on this one. We'll get your thoughts on Creatures of the Night, especially following Music from the Elder and Killers. So okay. when this album came out, when did you first become aware of it? You know, where did you first I, hear anything from it? And what were like your you guys? Like you guys, I was always at Record Factory. I was always at the little record store, those ones on 86th Street, you know. I'd go at least three or four days a week after school. I would just go there, you know. That's when I saw it for the first time, Creatures of Night, and I bought it. I mean, I had to. Now, I'm not going to downplay this record. This is a really good Kiss record, right? But I was raised on 70s Kiss. So I was more used to, like, the sleazy kind of glam, more rock and roll Kiss. This is metal Kiss. For sure. This, this took a totally different turn for me. By the time this album was out, I had already heard Too Fast for Love by Molly Crew, And I was hooked on that. Like, that was my kind of music. Like, to me, that's what I like. You know, I like fast rock and roll, you know. That's what made me realize that back in the day. I either like the music like fast rock and roll or I like Slayer, you know. <laughs> um, Mid-range metal, just kind of like, eh, you know, I, I don't fall for it. But because it's Kiss, I'm going to, of course, say this is a really good album, but it just wasn't what I was looking for at the moment. And this album kind of set a precedent for everything that came after it, right? Yeah. They lost that kind of like Deuce and Strutter and even like the stuff on Destroyer and Rock and Roll Over, which is my favorite Kiss album of all time. That Kiss was gone. Like, I don't hear that Kiss at all on this record. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. I'm, it's not for me to decide, you know, but as far as an album goes, this is a really good record. And Paul Stanley really shines on this record. I got to say, I think his vocals from this album to like maybe Asylum, his vocals are strongest. Like they're really, he's pow he's got a really powerful voice. He's not really always looked at as one of those dudes that has a great voice, great singing voice, but for this kind of music, man, Paul Stanley kills it, kills it on this record. I'll move on to my favorite song on the record, if that's okay. Sure. I'm going to say I Still Love You is my favorite song on this record. And that is a Paul Stanley 
showcase that song is unbelievable and it's even better in the live version from that uncensored the animalized uncensored show it, the man is pouring his heart out in that song and 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 it's totally i mean it's it's unbelievable that would be my first favorite song on this record i know you know it's not your typical kiss song and maybe that's why i like it because i'm not you know the heavy metal eh, you know i could take it or leave it but that's a really good song can i bring uh, up the unplugged version is also really great i was actually going to say that one fantastic. the mtv unplugged version is unbelievable too <laughs> I agree. fantastic yeah. right absolutely 100 percent. and and it's a good song i mean it's a really well constructed love song the other I, I mean, I know we've heard it a billion times, but my second favorite song is War Machine on this album. That's Gene's moment to shine. Gene really brings it home on that one, you know? The third favorite song, I mean, in all actuality, for me, there's really not a bad song on this record. There's not many great songs on this record, but they're not bad. Like, even the bad ones are still pretty good. I would say my top three are... I still love you, War Machine, and probably the probably the title track, yeah, uh, Creatures of the Night. Because man, you hear that song, you know you're in for some shit. I would imagine, you know, when they when they open with that, they open with that a few times when I saw them, and it was, it, it's a good song to open up a show with, you know. Didn't they? Not too yes. long ago, they did, right? Yeah. Kiss well, I know that's that, Kiss that, Alive Three. Kiss Alive Three. Yeah, that's how they opened. Right. Exactly. I saw so that the Revenge right. Tour. I think the Revenge Tour was. Right. Yeah, that. I saw that at Lamore and I saw that at the Garden too. So I mean, for you know, it's a great opener. It's a ripper. The weak parts for me would probably be Keep Me Coming, because it's just so. Come in. It's so like. <laughs> it's like that's the one song where Paul just sounds like a whiny bitch. Um. You know, I wanted to say with Keep Me Coming when I was going over the songwriters, I wanted to say written by Paul Stanley and Adam Mitchell and possibly Jimmy Page and Robert Plant. Mm. Exactly, (laughs) exactly, exactly. Yeah, right. They definitely threw their salt and pepper on that. The total Zeppelin Uh, best. Satan Singer is not a great song either and Killer is kind of eh. But everything else on the album, pretty good. (laughs) I like Danger. I like Rock and Roll Hell. It's okay. This is like, I think, where Gene Simmons kind of reestablished himself as the demon. You know? Oh, yeah. I mean, first of all, 100%. First of all, there's so many genisms with his voice on this album, you know. Totally. totally. Bitch is insane. Machine, he deals with pain. Right. God, <laughs> like, I mean, you think of Gene, <laughs> you think of Gene Simmons, right? The three, the three Gene Simmons staples are God of Thunder, Love It Loud, and War Machine. I yes. Mean, and, and that's two out of three, man. Two out of three on one album. Uh-huh. That's, a, yeah. that's a big statement this album made a huge impact when it came out but like for me like i said i was already listening to like glam you know i was already listening to like motley Crue, hanoi rocks things like yeah. that uh and my taste just kind of falls back to that a little bit more but i do enjoy this record uh, as a as a lifelong kiss fan i was like hey kiss is doing something you know it's not the elder and it's certainly not unmasked we all know how i feel about unmasked <laughs> Yes, we certainly but, do. But this is a good record. This is a really good record, and I enjoy it. And like I said, it's the staple for what's to come. And I know we'll talk about those more, but this is kind of like the blueprint for the next four or five records, you know, whatever it is, three or four records. Oh, yeah, yeah. They 100%. definitely, they, even though it, it didn't go on to sell a lot of copies initially, yeah, this was like the album that they basically had to follow for a long this time. This was the comeback. This was the comeback. This was it, yeah. you know. Uh, and, and they always and listen, they, they always they, used it as their measuring stick. You know, this album is our next creatures. This album is our next destroyer. You know, how right. many times have we heard that? So exactly. Yeah. And the band was in shambles. You know, mm-hmm. no Peter, no Ace. Everything was falling to pieces. I mean, Peter yeah. was gone for a little while already. And like, you know, if you don't have a lead guitar player, I mean, they they loved Ace so much that they were still putting him on the record covers. You know, well, and they had like they to won. also contractually that was one of the reasons why they kept him on the album cover and they put him in the liner notes even though he had no participation in it because it was part of their contract if you don't have at least three original members they had to renegotiate so the kids were trying to kind of be sly and try to hide it and they they only could only hide it for so long and then phonogram was like wait a minute who's this other guy that's on stage with you wait a minute you know who's this guy with the onk yeah (laughs) so so yeah they had to 
completely played. renegotiate their deal once they were basically caught. And they're like, well, you don't have Ace in the band. Now you only have two original members. We need to renegotiate. So they, they actually lost, you know, significant millions of dollars, you know, with that. And this is the, this is the album where they played their biggest show, right? That show in uh, Brazil, right? Or something like that. Wasn't yeah, where it's either. We played in front of 150,000. That was rock. We played in front of 300,000. Rock and Rio, right? Yeah. yeah it's like, yeah. yeah, they played in front of, they definitely played in front of like a six figure crowd, but I don't know if they've ever really said exactly how many. You know, that's my feelings on Creatures of the Night. Great record. Kind of like, you know, took me in a different direction with Kiss, took everybody in a different direction with Kiss. I wasn't sure whether it was my flavor or not, but I enjoyed it. It's a great record. Okay. Let's go to Steve next, since Steve is a very huge fan of this record. I'm sure you're very anxious to discuss <laughs> your favorite tracks and maybe not as anxious to discuss your least favorite tracks. <laughs> what, um, right. what is your feeling on Creatures of the Night? Well, to kind of tie in what Ron was talking about, I became a fan of Kiss from the early inception of the band, that, or the, the original four. That's you know pretty much like all of us. That's how we kind of jumped into Kiss. I remember the first album I ever bought was Kiss Alive One. So take that and and I rewind back to me saying the drums were the most important thing for me. So Peter Chris was my guy growing up. Oddly enough, I went from Peter Chris straight to Eric Singer. I went from that, you know, look, looking up all the early versions of Kiss and then just steamrolling right to Revenge and Unplugged. I bypassed the Eric Carr years. I just didn't care. Yeah. So Creatures is actually within the last, I want to say, 15 years has become my favorite Kiss album. And Eric Carr has become my <laughs> one and two. Him and Eric Singer. I do love Eric Singer as a drum. But Eric Carr really shines on this album. And now I'm going to jump into Creatures. Eric Carr is the unsung hero of this album. You, he brought energy, life that low end into this band and it shines on every single cut on this album. Unlike songs on albums in the past, there's no lulls in this album. I mean, there's no ballads. I mean, I mean, you could say I still love you as a ballad, but it rocks. I mean, those drums are thunderous and I, and I know I'm going to be very boring and keep talking about the drums, but I'll say it's that's not a I'm... power ballad. It's not a power ballad in the sense of how they became later on. Sure. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So going into it, I, I mean, you hear so much of Eric's influence of John Bonham on this album, just sonically, but not just sonically. I mean, you listen to I Love It Loud, that's a John Bonham riff. It's simple, it's pocket, it's as memorable and as iconic to me as when the levee breaks. When mm -hmm. I hear I Love It Loud kick off, I mean, I'm in. <laughs> it's like, that's it. And for what I do for a living, I work in sports television and I go all over the country to all these arenas all over the world. And it boggles my mind that that's not a staple in all these arena in-house music that they play. You hear the same songs, you know, you hear We Will Rock You. We'll, you'll hear, you know, up until, you know, maybe 20 odd years ago, you would hear Gary Glitter, you know. You would yeah, hear all yeah. these iconic, right? No, rock and roll songs these days. No, you don't hear much. <laughs> but why don't you hear I Love It Loud? I don't get it. I, I feel like in any stadium in the world, you hear those drums kick off, the crowd's going to feel it. So, and that I feel starts like I've heard it before, though. I feel like I've heard it at a sporting event or two. Maybe like in the MSG like would the seem reunion like a place tour. that would probably do it. Right. Like you maybe know. after the 96 reunion tour, I heard it maybe a few times, but not, not like you're saying, Steve, it should be like every day. It should be like, we will. It rock. should be every day. Every right. day I should hear that. I mean, the crowd would get into it, but be that as it's meant. These, the, these I think that drum meant. pattern is, it's kind of similar to, we will rock you. Yeah. So if you're going to play one or the other, <laughs> I think yeah, right. people are just going to go, Oh, we'll do, we will rock you. Cause it's, it has that bump, bump, huh? It's a Absolutely. similar, it, it's even though so I don't think simple. it's a rip off, I don't think it's a rip off, but it, it just has that. It's a simple beat, you know, mm -hmm. the main guitar riff of the verses is kind of like my generation though. It's just in a different okay. key. I'll buy that. I'm going to say Gina has been quoted. I think Gina has been quoted to say that's where he kind of stole it from. Yeah. Okay. Openly. Makes sense. That's wild. So going back to what Ron said with, with the swankiness of the original four, what this incarnation of the band didn't have was that swing that Peter Chris had. Peter Chris 
we all know, and it's been said a million times, he's a jazz drummer that's stuck in a rock and roll band. And that swing and that feel came across in all those original albums. This album, we finally got to see Eric, who is a Brooklyn Italian rock and roll guy, really sit right in the front of the mix and just drive that bus. And that's what comes across. That's what comes through your speakers is those the heaviness of the drums. And there's no real swing. I mean, Danger, yeah, it has, has like a shuffle pattern. Same with Creatures of the mm-hmm. Night. They, they do have a shuffly pattern and it does move forward in that sense, but it doesn't have that jungle groove or the Gene Krupa-like styles of, of Peter Chris. It didn't I, I think Saint, Saint and Sinner swings. I actually wrote Swing Down uh, as a it note does. for that song. It, yeah. That boom, 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 mm-hmm. boom, 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 yeah. boom. It's a shuffle. It's absolutely, it's definitely a shuffle. And, and yeah, mate. going back, I was listening to, um, I was listening to the album as a, well, I was cooking dinner actually. And I had my headphones on and I, and I just never really paid attention to it. Danger. If you listen, it's panned hard to the left, really subtle. Someone's keeping a straight, just triplet on the hi hat on a yeah. hi-hat that's really faint and it's panned all the way hard right is what Eric is actually playing. Correct. He's playing that all the way. So that was interesting. I, I like the way that, you know, that came across could sonic. Could have been Alan Schwartzberg. Who the heck knows? Yeah, right? really, you know yeah. to do drum overdubs yep. on yep. Animal Eyes, I think. Mm-hmm. Animal Eyes, yeah. 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 All right. Now I have to tell you what my favorite is. is that the, how are we going to do it? Yeah. Favorite track? You know, all right, cool. A couple, two, three favorite tracks. All right, um, two tree, couple two of tree. two tree, <laughs> two tree. Yeah, tree. Yeah, what else you got? Um, the number one for me is uh, War Machine. And okay. I get up every time for that one. Um, live studio cut, whatever. It, it's a, it's it's a killer, man. No pun intended. That one, it just really it works for me. I, I don't know what it. Is. I just feel like it sits back in the pocket a little bit, and it's Gene being Gene, and that's what I like. I mean, mentioned it earlier. If God of Thunder is to be synonymous with Gene, then this is the next, like, 1B. This is right underneath it for me. If, if I needed to, if I had to pick a set list and I had to choose a Sophie's Choice between the two, I would pick War Machine over <laughs> God of Thunder, to be honest. So War Machine, number one for me. I got to say Creatures, title track, comes out just swinging. So the mm-hmm. first track and the last track, I really dig that. Nice bookends. And... um. I mean, for sake of my argument before, I'll just say uh, I love it loud because it's, it's that talk about pocket that sits right in the pocket. It's simple. Every yeah. drummer, any person that ever pick up a pair of drumsticks can really sit back and play that song. There's really nothing difficult about it, but the timing and the feel is second to none. It's incredible. So I'll say that my least favorite is rock and roll hell. I never really got behind that one. I think lyrically it's kind of dull. Not that I, I really run to kiss for lyrical, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. depth. It's not like I'm running to like a, a Bob Dylan or anything like that, <laughs> or Tom Waits. But yeah, Rock and Roll High felt was just the one of the weaker ones. This was the last album for me that Gene was Gene until Revenge, when he came back out with Unholy. So you had Gene really trying on this album. And then, as we all know, there was this weird gap <laughs> called the 80s. Mm-hmm. And then we had Revenge. So this is kind of like the, the brother-sister album to Revenge for me. Okay. Let's move on to Joe. What are your thoughts on Creatures of the Night? And do you recall when you, when you first heard it? And what were your impressions? I think I first heard I Love It Loud. I think it was given to me like on a mixtape or something when I was like in fourth grade. So I really, I mean, I think that song was kind of around, you know, in the ether. It was kind of the known track. So I, I, you know, I dug that song and then I picked up the album. First of all, let's discuss the album cover just a little bit because sure. it's a cool cover. I have oh, my it's... old copy here. And, you know, I mean, this is a classic to me. <laughs> Blah! <laughs> good one. That was good. I was like, uh, wait a minute. Wait a I minute. Mean, wait a minute. <laughs> this is one of the great album covers, I think. I mean, it's undisputable. <laughs> just beauty. I bought this. I showed mine earlier. In um, Red Bank, New Jersey. I think it's the same record store that's in uh, Chasing Amy. Huh. 
when they're in, there's a whole scene shot in that record store. I believe it, it was the same one. So I don't know. I, I don't know why I bought this. I, had, I, I, I don't know. I was just shocked by the cover. I was like, what the hell? I didn't even know what the album was. And then I realized later there's a much cooler version and I should have gotten that one. It's actually now highly desirable just because it's harder to find. Yeah, I, of, yeah, I would like, like a, to find like a nicer copy like a, now. Like all of maybe a sudden, I'll like sell the, this and buy, you know, the the real <laughs> the real ones with the with the earnings. Yeah, the eighties. <laughs> yeah, I'll buy it. The eighties <laughs> pressings of all those records are now collectibles. You know, Kiss fans are just a bunch yeah. of lunatics. You know, they they could make you know a piece of shit collectible. You know, literally. You know what I mean? It's like it, it's crazy. I think this album, uh, I'm kind of, I sit kind of like where uh, Ron sits with it. I think it's a very good record. I think there's a lot of hyperbole like surrounding this record. It's Steve's favorite Kiss record. You know, I don't really see why that might be, but um, I kind in a way I kind of do. I don't know. It's like, I'm kind of like split. I think it's a good record. The people that love it, that's like in their top one, two, three. I kind of see why, but I kind of don't when I think it's, it's that 70s output is just just cooler, just overall cooler. You know, so I don't know. I'm just like torn. Every time I hear this record, I'm always kind of like, what was going on back then musically? You know, this is like sure. pre, pre-Quiet Riot, pre like Twisted Sister and Motley Crue getting really big, pre-Rat pre that whole hair metal explosion post quiet riot and it's like post it's just after back in black ozzy you know ozzy's first couple albums it, dio it's like sitting in that 80 to 83 kind of weird British region deal. of like traditional metal is just like it's kind of coalescing and you have judas priest you know um so I, I just wonder where, like, when Kiss is like, all right, we're coming back strong, we're coming back hard, heavy. Who are they scanning the scene in the city tonight and trying to, like, who are you, who are you up against? Like, who are we co- comparing ourselves to? And I hear, I personally hear a lot of Judas Priest on this record. Interesting. I hear like a screaming for vengeance type stuff. I hear a uh, British steel, like th- that kind of guitar attack, the chugga, chugga, chugga type stuff. And I think it, it sits well, you know, among, amongst that stuff, you know, there was a lot of like, I don't know, stuff like riot, you know, like where metal was like still like just pre thrash also. It was well, just kind of just Maiden heavy. Was and, out, right? Was Maiden, Maiden was out. Maiden was, Maiden, Maiden Maiden was definitely right? out. Yeah. But yeah, I don't I know. If, first, yeah. I think they maybe took some stuff from Maiden, but Maiden was much more serious, much darker. And I, I think they may have grabbed some influence here and there, but I think they were looking more towards the Aussies and the Dio's and the Judas Priests, where there was just an access, more, a little bit more of an accessibility, a radio accessibility there. Def Leppard, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, uh, they were definitely going for like a guitar slinger vibe at, at that time and even in the book that me- mentioning randy Rhodes, mentioning eddie van halen that van had, halen right you know yeah exactly so it, they were they were feeling that guitar driven virtuosic playing at that time which was different obviously from what we heard in, in you know albums in the past from kiss yeah it, but the funny funnily enough though Vinny is not really r- ripping loose on the circuit he's more of a songwriter yes right. So it's like that doesn't even come to play until like lick it up, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe a little bit. He was helping them write tight, right. hard rocking songs, which is I think he he did his job there. So you know I dig this record. I don't love it. I much prefer the seventies classic stuff, but it makes sense given what was happening in the time, and for that I can appreciate it. You know I think my favorite song is uh, I love it loud. Okay. It's it, to me. It's really anthemic. We spoke about the drum intro. It just has all the makings of a great arena. It's like a stomper, you know. Kind of yeah. same thing with War Machine. War Machine to me a little less so. I think uh, the video for "I Love It Loud" was cool too. Definite highlights are uh, "I Still Love You." Paul, he's going for it. He is going for it. 
there's drama in that song. They like just, you know, the, the drums build up. Dun, 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 dun. It's like, it's, it's all there. That song is a complete package. It's impressive. It's an impressive, like, arrangement, you know. Even though it's not my favorite song, I, I, I give it a lot of props, you know. The fact that it uh, translated to uh, acoustic, an acoustic version, like 15 years later, you know, uh, perfectly, it came out awesome. Creatures of the Night, I think this album is like a mission statement, you know, like we're back, we're tough, and yeah. it works, you know. Funnily enough, though, all the props this record gets, I think Lick It Up is actually a little bit better of a record. We'll talk about that some other time, but for all the props this record gets, it, I just think that one is actually, it, it like fulfills some of the broken promises on this record, if there are any, you know, I don't know. I think there's pound for pound some better songs. Sorry if I went ahead a little bit. No, that, that's perfectly okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I think Killer is a weak song. Kind of just like a, you know, I, it makes sense. It was next to last. You don't want to end the record on this. War Machine is a better ending. This was like tucked way in the back. It's, it's kind of a nothing song. And I agree with Ron, uh, which is the whiny song. Keep me coming. Keep me coming. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 Keep me coming to me has the beginnings of Paul starting to do the super high singing that to me got grating as the 80s went on. To me, that's like the first flashings of it. It's like, oh, okay, this is my way. <clears throat> my way <laughs> that came much yeah. later yeah. much yeah, yeah. that was, was yeah, much we'll later get to that in a few years well, in terms of albums <laughs> not, not the podcast <laughs> yeah i was gonna say i hope it doesn't take a few years to get no. to that record <laughs> and i just want to point I, out one I lyric wait. that i that i find <laughs> funny i don't know if it's funny or clever but in uh the end of in saint and sinner where gene goes i'm not gonna die cross my heart and hope to die <laughs> just like yeah. Yeah. okay <laughs> not gonna die that is pretty odd cross that is my heart and hope to die that's that's the point where he realizes he's no roger waters <laughs> let me rhyme die with I'm surprised uh, paul let that die one. i'm surprised paul stanley let that one go like you lazy bastard what the hell is that <laughs> and he got gene, on him about songs with, later on gene, maybe it's maybe it's, line? A, maybe it's a genius line and i'm just not i don't know he's it's he meant it to be so fucking on the note, so obviously bad that it's great. Anyway, I could say a lot more stuff, but I feel like I've I've spoken a lot, so maybe I'll, we'll touch on it later. But somebody else go. Let's move on to my brother Vincent here on Creatures of the Night, and I can recall, and I don't know if you borrowed the record from Michael Brunn, but I can definitely recall when you had the record in our old house in Bensonhurst, and playing it downstairs in the basement and mesmerized by that album cover, you know, even as like, I was like six years old at that point. And I, I remember thinking that was a, such a cool album cover and the original, like, of course. I, yeah. The original, of course, the blue yeah. one. And I, I, I couldn't stop nagging you to listen to it, uh, you know, as I recall, but did, did you borrow it at that point from, from Michael yeah. Brunn? And what was, what was this like around 83, 84? Yeah. Around 83, 84. Yeah. Because it wasn't until a couple of years well, maybe a few years later. I don't have a sticker on it, but I think I bought my copy at It's Only Rock and Roll or whatever. Because at that point, the new cover was the one that you could buy in the stores. And right. so this was hard to find. First of all, you know, this record was viewed as a failure, you know, uh, as far as in sales and in tour for Kiss. You True. know, so despite you had to cancel all the praise it that, into the tour. So despite all the praise that most Kiss fans, you know, look back at, you know, give it now as one of the best Kiss records, it wasn't really look like at that you know i think kiss was still in a weird position you know i think there was you know the judas priest the maidens the motley crews the aussies that were the up and coming you know metal that was coming out and kiss was kind of like oh yeah that band kiss you know they wore the makeup in in the 70s and you know it wasn't they, i think they really were trying to establish their ground but they they hadn't really done it yet i think it was really until animalize and heavens on fire came out and with MTV, or maybe even Lick It Up, I should say, but, you know, Lick It Up and then Animalize, where they really started to get their footing back, you know, to establish themselves again. But yeah, I mean, I, when I first heard this record, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing sonically. Yeah. <laughs> that was the first thing. Yeah. And just one quick note about looking at both records, I didn't realize, and I didn't remember that, you know, they have different orders. So in other words, yeah. Saint and Sinner on the original pressing was the second song. 
and in the, the newer pressing, it was killer. And they right. put Satan Sinner to second to last on the second edition. So for whatever reason they did that, I don't know, it was just to be There's different. There's really no or, rhyme or reason behind that. Yeah. It's just almost like they just did it to do it. It's kind of silly. I, I, yeah, I have Satan Sinner as this next to last. It's really the one that looks like a Lane Bryant catalog cover. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is that Gene Simmons' ass, by the way? No, I think it's Paul's. I, I think it's supposed to be Certainly Paul's. Hope not. By the way, is that the Gene Simmons where it it's was? It's a scratch and sniff, actually. <laughs> is that the Gene Simmons animalized wig he's wearing, or is that a different? Oh wig yeah, that that's he's wearing definitely the animalized wig, for sure. <laughs> um, Bruce is wearing animalized pants. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> actually, I think you guys probably have seen the photo session from from this shoot that's been on. They've been sharing it, you know, I don't know, I've seen it over the past couple of months. I've seen some you other see photos, the, yeah. yeah. I think that guy, Niels Lau 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 Lau, I can never pronounce his name. Slows Hour? Slows Hour, you know, I think oh, he was the one who took he pictures shot that of that. photo? Oh, interesting. I think so, yeah. I think it was on the roof of somewhere in the city. So where was I going with this? Yeah, so you asked me about when I first uh, heard it or... Yeah, or your, your yeah. impression. Was this around the time you were really getting the early part of your starting to kind of get back into Kiss? Because we yeah, talked this about this is with where, the Elder. Yeah, this is where I think I kind of admitted on the last time where I was breaking away from the Denise Williams, let's hear from the boy, you know, 45s that I was buying to, to yeah, this some, was before you know, real... all that again. This was before Denise Williams and your goddamn, it's well, let's hear from the I, boy, 45. Well, <laughs> I think, but, but remember, I didn't listen to this when it first came out. It was, it was around 80, 83, 84. Right, so okay. I think Footloose, okay. I think I had already bought that 45. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, I was really starting to get, it was really the quiet riot. Don't uh, come on, feel the noise was really the, my first, like where I started getting into heavy metal. And then it was finding out about Def Leppard and Rat and those, those bands in 83 and Motley Crue and, and that stuff. But as you know, and as we were growing up, you know, the drums were a big part of like what would become what we had in the basement and what we would start playing. So yeah, of course the drums were like, the thing is when you listen to the record, you could listen to you know, a lot of Zeppelin records and, and, and it's just iconic drumming and drum sounds that were produced on those records. And really no other record from before Creatures of Night or really after, in my opinion, uh, sounds like Creatures of Night. You know, it's been quoted that Tommy Lee, when they were doing, I think it was Dr. Feelgood, said to Bob Rock, I want that sound that they got on Creatures of the Night. You know, that's the drum sound I want. Uh, I mean, you could verify that quote, but I know that either it was Dr. Feelgood or if it was um, the Girls, Girls, Girls record, but I'm going to think more like Dr. Feelgood. That's that the first I've heard sound. of that. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was pretty cool to, that he noted that. I think it was St Steve was saying that um, Eric Carr is the unsung hero here, and I agree with him. However, I really think that uh, Michael James Jackson was the unsung hero because it was Michael James Jackson and, and his engineers that came up with that sound. Sure. You know, you could take if 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 you listen to Smashes, Thrashes, and Hits, listen to that version of "I Love It Loud." Yeah. All right. So when they turn off all those microphones, I was fortunate enough, and I think at that same indie convention where they had Michael James Jackson on the stage, and you were able to ask questions. And of course, I took the opportunity to raise my hand and say, "Hey, how did you come up with that sound for Creatures of the Night?" And then he went into this whole long, you know, explanation of what mics he used and how the room. And it was awesome. Like for me as an engineer and producer and all that stuff, I was always curious of how he got the sound. And, and you really understand that, you know, it was really him and the engineers. I mean, Kiss could have said, or I could have said, I want a big drum sound, but they, they didn't have the skills or the qualifications to actually do that. So I think that it should really be mentioned that Michael really crafted that drum sound for the record. Um, the other thing- Why didn't he that, craft a cool guitar sound? Yeah. <laughs> well, that one I can't answer. I didn't ask him that question. But um, but one of the things I, I think I may have alluded to when we had our last discussion was I was fortunate enough to hear the actual writing sessions that exist for both Creatures of Night and Lick It Up. And as far as I know, it's only in two or three people's hands right now. It's not something that's out there. And I have a friend of mine who's actually acquired these through Vinnie Vincent. And I was fortunate enough to sit in his backyard last summer and listen to some of the writing sessions for like, I love it loud. I still love you. Vinnie, if you listen to these writing sessions, he is leading the writing sessions totally. A lot of the times he's the one singing. For, yeah. the, for most of the writing session of I love it loud, you hear Vinnie Vincent singing lyrics, some of which made it and some of which didn't. 
and then you'll hear him, you know, talking with Gene, and in the same way in Paul, you know, so the whole thing is, did Vinnie Vincent save Kiss? You know, we debate that all the time, but I, I could tell you, hearing it firsthand on those writing sessions, you know, he was really, really instrumental in, in crafting a lot of songs. I Still Love You is another one. You know, you hear him playing the guitar, you hear him initially singing some of the melody lines, and, and, and then Paul kind of taking it from there. But, you know, Paul was a very active in these writing sessions, too, so I don't want to make this like it was all the Vinnie show. So that was very interesting to hear the perspective of, like, what was going on at that time and the little discussions in between, you know, the phone ringing and stuff like that of what they were trying to accomplish, you know, getting like kind of like a, a secondhand listen to that stuff and them not knowing what this album would be. I always try to think like listening to it at a time where, you know, you had never heard it before, the songs weren't fully recorded yet and what they were thinking, you know, that's how when I'm listening to something, what I try to do. So that was very, really cool to hear. What would you pick as top favorite tracks and least favorite? I always loved uh, Creatures of the Night, of course. It's some of the obvious choices. I, I, yeah. I still love you. Danger was always one of my favorites on this record, you know, just because like of, the, of the, the, just the drums are just kill. I mean, I've, you know, like Steve, like my brother, I don't know if anybody else plays drums here, and I'm sorry if I don't know that, but I've tried to play that, that shuffle groove in Danger. It's not the easiest thing to do, you know, not, not with the intensity that he plays it. And what I love about Eric's playing on this, this record is on a song like Eric was really, really cool of like using Tom Toms. Um, like even you would see on the, I remember watching Kiss Animal Eyes Uncensored where he'd be like riding the, the, the uh, or, you know, a Tom, you yeah. know, instead of a ride symbol or like even on something like, um, lick it up, know, he does the to lick it up or yeah. That's pretty or tears unique. are falling. Yeah, dun, yeah, dun, 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 yeah. Dun, boom, boom, boom. You know, he was he was really cool. Of like, even uh, Heaven's on Fire, he's not playing a, a straight groove throughout. He's you know doing all kinds of Tom things. But what I love about I Still Love You is when it really gets intense at the end, and Paul saying I still love. You know, he's like he's really intensifying what Paul is singing there, and they just let him go. You know, and and it's just so awesome his drums and I think it really just really brings that song to a, a climax at the end. It just really makes it explode and accent what he's doing. So mm -hmm. I would probably say those are my three favorites. Okay. So then what would be your least favorite? Is it pretty much like everybody else here? And I think so. Keep, yeah. Keep I coming? don't want to be repetitive. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I, you know, like, I don't think there's no, I don't think there's a love's a deadly weapon on this, on this record. I'm sorry <laughs> if somebody likes that song or, you know, uh, <laughs> You know, something, you know, some other shit burgers, as my brother would say, you know? <laughs> you know, but, you know, it's really I don't think there's really a bad track on this record, which is cool, you know, because yeah. we know on some other kids records, there's some bad tracks. But listen, I think this is a great record. I agree with the guys. It's not a rock and roll over. It's not the first Kiss album. It's not, you know, hot and hot. but you got to remember, too, music was changing. You know, let's think about what was popular during this time, you know, and what was popular in 1974 and mm -hmm. how keyboards and synthesizers were starting to make their ways more into into the mainstream and, and eventually into heavy metal even like a album like 84 by van halen you know and, and so that's and and listen to photograph or any of those that def leppard record as we come to know it's a drum machine it's not yeah. even real drums you know so to that point if you think about that creatures of the night real drums real drummer 1982 Pyromania is what, 83? Well, yep. You know, not much later, if you look yep. when the album was released, and it's a drum machine, you know? Yeah. So think about that. I think that's important to note. Good points made. So I want to piggyback off what you guys were saying uh, as far as my overall opinions on the record. I obviously love the record. I, I regard it pretty highly. But, you know, having said that, I do agree that some fans probably it's like revenge it's like revenge in a way but revenge more so i think some fans put revenge on a very very high pedestal Steve. Whereas, <laughs> <laughs> everything whereas, you're about to say you're going to describe steve right now. <laughs> well, not to disparage <laughs> not to disparage steve here tell but, me about me <laughs> but i think i think a lot of fans would say you know revenge is like the perfect kiss album but I don't really agree with that. I, I, I think Revenge is half of a really great album and then half of a, a subpar album. 
not a terrible half of an album, but I don't think it's their greatest album out of makeup. I'll just put it that uh, way. Out of, out of respect to Steve, I will say that I think that album's overrated. That's my opinion. Yeah, on it. yeah, that that's my point. Is is to me, Revenge is a little overrated. I think some people would probably say Creatures of the Night is a little overrated because yes, it has the standout tracks that we mentioned. But yeah, you know, most people aren't gonna rush to put Killer or Saint and Sinner or Keep Me Coming on on a it, best of. It's compilation. like when you're starving, right? It's like Eddie Murphy says, like when you're starving and someone throws you a cracker, you know, you're like, oh my best God, that's cracker. Best that's cracker. Best that cracker. That's salty. That's a Ritz. Oh, is that a Ritz? You know, it's like it's like that's a Ritz, right? A Ritz. Can I have some old, please? That's true. It's like Kiss was like, you know, they were like on a downward turn, and they give us Creatures of the Night. They threw it at us, and we we're like, oh, this. Right. Is- really good but is it rock and roll over good is it destroyer good is it alive good well I, you can't really count a live album is it dressed to kill good absolutely not and steve defend us, your fucking record here come on let's go. And, then they, and then they got us to no nah, no nah, listen it's still a good record though compared to because later well, on you know we you know we get later on after this we get crazy yeah. nights well you know um, what to, to <laughs> someone's point before I th- it might have been joe Lick It Up is a better album than Creatures of the Night. I mean, I'll, I'll say I it right like, now before we even get to that episode. Yeah. Lick It Up is a better album than Creatures of the Night. They're right. They're right. It was such a global change, though, with the makeup gone and everything. And Vinny actually being a member now. Yeah. You know, like that. But was, they were more of like it a was band. a different band. It was but they were more of like band. a band at that point, at least. Because right. you, had the, right. ghost, you me, had the ghost session guys. You had the, the other songwriters. You had the other guitar players coming in. You had a fucking guitar player that goes and ends up playing in Mr. Mister. I mean, you know. It's like a right, cast of characters, really you know. Lick It Up then, was like a solid, you know, Kiss album. So I think Lick It Up definitely should be lauded a little bit more than Creatures of the Night. But generally, I don't think it really is. But again, I'm saying all this not to even disparage Creatures of the Night or really anyone's opinion on it. You know, if they hold it high in regard, that's that's fine. You know, well, they, totally. They, that's fine. The but one- I just think it's 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 like you guys said, it's not a rock and roll over. It's not like the classic first few you know kiss studio records but it's it's a very right. good record if you're doing a star rating system out of five stars i think you got to give creatures at a night at least three stars if I'm anything just, the production you know, just, brings it up there too three and let you say that because i want to say fuck you to rolling stone for giving it one star right off the bat okay i meant to say that a bunch of you know what i mean that's just the, you know so rolling anyways. stone and kiss were never yeah so well, that's why take. yeah I'm sorry. <laughs> just fucking disgusts me. Anyways. Yeah. Okay. You so got, I'm glad you, you brought it because I meant to bring that one up. And then on your cue of saying that, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I looked that up. You want to throw in a uh, fuck David Frick and, you know, that Joey Ramone lookalike <laughs> bastard? The fucking, yeah. VH1 fucking every one of those VH1 fucking specials. I had to see that fucking Joey Ramone lookalike. Yeah. <laughs> I mentioned it in the fucking Nirvana episode. I made the joke then, so I make the joke again yeah. now. <laughs> okay. Well. I think we pretty much talked about the record. Do you guys want to mention anything else about it before we sign off here? Any other final uh, thoughts, closing thoughts about Creatures of the Night? That reissue was bizarre, though. That reissue with the, uh, <laughs> with the Lane Bryant cover. I mean, what the hell was going yeah. on there? And that came out later on, right? Hey, like, what was, was the exact released. explanation behind 85. that? What was the exact explanation uh, behind why they decided to reissue that? From, when, from it did, heard... when it wasn't generally successful the first time i think from what i heard was because it wasn't successful and this was the lineup they were trying to regenerate sales with this as kind of maybe fooling people a little bit like oh shit you know this is the current kiss this is a new record for people who were just getting on the kiss bandwagon whatever it was like a new product and it was and you know it's like anything else they saw something that visually and let's face facts it wasn't the way kiss is now with with the fans wanting everything but maybe they said oh it's an alternate version of this and people will eat it up because they'll start buying it let's also point out that this was released two or three months before asylum yeah 1985 so asylum hadn't even been released yet so they're capitalizing off of how well lick it up and animalize were doing at this point right they're probably like hey in case you missed it you know, right. the same guys that did Animal Eyes did this, too. It was like, oh, okay. And, you know, so yeah, multiple, I, multiple copies. It, it kind of makes sense for them to put a different cover, just strictly find the business speaking, yeah. like, confuse yeah. people who don't know. And, oh, it's a new it's a new thing by, this, by the band Kiss I Know Now. It makes sense on that shitty level. 
I had both. Even though no one, up. no one in their right mind would think that the, the reissue cover is a cooler cover. I mean, but I, don't maybe, know, I just don't get I, it. I've, I've, yet, I've yet to hear or see anybody say that the newer album cover is cooler than the original. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, <laughs> everybody yeah, thinks so. Except, crazy. Everybody thinks it's not cooler except Bruce Kulick. <laughs> yeah, he's like, <laughs> yeah. he's like, no, maybe Bruce Kulick I, loves I have, it. I have some good reasons to buy it. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually out. looking really quick to see. Was that why his arms are crossed? Was he had a little yeah, chill there? I was like, ooh, it's cold. It's, it's, it's not enough body gloves. Delicate. Oh, yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. All right. Gotta go. Somebody get me a cardigan. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Hey, Bob, that was good. That was good. Get me a cardigan. <laughs> People who have the portable heater. <laughs> yeah, neil. <laughs> neil do you have a portable heater for the roof neil you guys want to have a little fun uh i want to talk about albums that were released near or on the same day as creatures of the night hit me yeah man all right well then this one will definitely amuse you i think but uh a day after maybe these release dates are not exactly accurate who knows but for the sake of the episode and for the sake of fun, it says here that on October 29th, Donald Fagan released The Nightfly, <laughs> which means our father oh, was Jesus at the record Christ. store either on Phenomenal. October 30th or, yeah, yeah. or November 1st. Phenomenal album. Later. It is a great album. It, I own it. it. Yeah. I think, uh, I think Ron gave it a oh, Jesus Christ. I think I heard that one, right? <laughs> I did. I did. I don't like Jesus Christ. Life. Jesus Christ. What else? <laughs> what else, Pete? On October 27th, Prince released 1999. Was that a popular record? <laughs> yeah, no, that was popular. Yeah. I think it did okay. Yeah. I think it might have been yeah. hit. It might have been Let's... hit. Let me give you a couple of records that came out in 82. I did, Pete, I did a quick search on this. Number okay. of the Beast by on Iron Maiden. Yeah. Screaming for Vengeance. Mm-hmm. Uh, Judas Priest. Scorpions Blackout. <sighs> Shit. Uh, that was another right band there. I forgot to mention. Great yeah, album. Scorpions Those three records right there. Yeah, Blackout is amazing. That's my favorite Scorpion. My, my brother will appreciate this. Man of War Battle Hymns. Oh. <laughs> nice. It's a great record. Uh, Twisted poem. Sister. My... Twisted Sister Under the Blade. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. What year was that? 82. Yeah. Yeah. I saw him at Lemoore in 83. So yeah, like, so. yeah, man. Like, it's just like when Lick It Up, when Lick It Up came out, right? I was at Little Record Store on 86th Street. And I was like, I'm, I'm like... I'm going to go there after school and buy Lick It Up because I know Lick It Up came out today. So I went to the store and I pick up Lick It Up. I remember it was $5.99. And I take it to the counter and I give the guy the money and I grab it. And as I'm walking out, I turn around and fucking shout at the devil is there on the wall. Ooh. And I was like, yo, can I swap these out? He's like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> and I swapped it out and I bought Lick It Up like a couple of weeks later. And I'll tell you, best thing, best move I ever made. Wow. Because Motley... Motley Crue had, had, I think, had taken the, the throne at that point. I, and interestingly, would they would end up opening for Kiss on the Creatures tour, with right. shout mm-hmm. the, uh, behind Shout at the Devil. Yeah. So they were probably yeah. stealing the show. I would have to imagine from Kiss. I would uh, imagine a few, in a few were, markets. I, I would think yeah. a lot of people I saw were probably going to see Beacon. Crue instead of Kiss. <laughs> I saw Motley Crue at the Beacon on the Shout at the Devil tour, uh, awesome, with awesome. Rat opening up surprisingly, which was a friggin' awesome. Man, Man at that, that time, too, nice that had to be awesome. Great show. They must have been, um, the backstage for those shows must have been oh, out of control. It. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. If, if, if you did a, D, a, a fucking a DNA test back there, or, or oh. fucking a smash of the black light. Oh. Yeah, the black yeah, light. <laughs> They're just ju- right. body juices everywhere. Yeah. Oh, right. everywhere. Nothing but slime. Sounds like a, sounds like right. a future Gene Simmons. Movie. Body juices everywhere. <laughs> 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 Domino! <laughs> that's, that's great. Yeah, man. Well, I think that's a good way to <laughs> sign yeah, off. That's a fitting ending. It's a fitting it ending, a, as, as always. We always have is. ended kind of uncomfortably. You know, we're going <laughs> to go ahead and play our collective favorite tracks from Creatures of the Night. And let's give a hand to Steve first. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Steve. Very good. Thank you. Very good, good to be had. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, this was a lot of fun. Thank you, guys. Oh, it was my pleasure to have you here, and I will definitely invite you to future roundtables concerning Kiss for sure, and, and Donald Fagan, and Donald, Fagan. <laughs> definitely. and Donald Fagan. definitely. We're definitely right. going to do a, a ten-part roundtable discussion on the knife. Ten-part. <laughs> <laughs> we 
Well, we got, you know, <laughs> wake me, only, wake me when it's there's over. Only, there's only six tracks on it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> One and a half days each track. Yeah. I'm going to really analyze each and every inch of that record. But That's whatever. right. So let's play our collective favorite tracks from Creatures of the Night. And I'm going to go with the songs that you guys named the most. And we're going to start with Creatures of the Night, followed by Danger. Then I Love It Loud. I Still Love You. And closing out with The Riff Machine by Gene. War Machine. So Steve, Joe, Ron, Finn, thank you very much for joining me here once again for this Kiss Roundtable Part 6 on Killers and Creatures of the Night. And let's go to the tracks right now. Joe, play it. Kiss no Brasil, Maracanã, Mineirão e Morumbi. All right, I am back. And as you just heard, that was Creatures of the Night, Danger, I Love It Loud, I Still Love You, and War Machine from the album Creatures of the of the night taken from my various pressings that I had shown earlier in the introduction of this episode. Creatures of the Night was taken from the original pressing from 1982. Danger was taken from the -the glow-in-the-dark pressing from 1995. I Love It Loud was taken from the 180-gram audiophile remastered pressing from 2014 I Still Love You was taken from the 1985 reissue pressing with the different album cover. And finally, War Machine was taken from the original pressing from 1982. So before I wrap up, I just want to mention something. Steve Malone and my brother Vincent had talked about Eric Carr. And my brother had mentioned the three of us are drummers. And I just want to say, if it wasn't for Eric Carr, more than Peter Chris, I probably wouldn't have become a drummer and end up fulfilling my own personal dreams as a musician. And I'll get more into that when we get to the album Animalize from 1984. But I just want to merely mention that after Eric had to go through that whole entire ordeal with music from The Elder and that not being the type of album that he envisioned recording as his first true studio album with Kiss. It really was great that he got to be the star basically of this album and the main focus point simply because of that thunderous drum sound that was accomplished here as my brother broke down earlier in the round table. So I just wanted to make mention of that and just say that even though Kiss didn't repeat this drum sound ever again for any other studio album that followed. In hindsight, it's probably a great thing that they didn't repeat the same drum sound because it only makes this album even more unique in the Kiss catalog. So that's all I wanted to say about that. We've come to the end of this episode and this latest roundtable, and we will be back soon with another brand new episode. And once again, I encourage everybody to follow us on YouTube And if you're just listening to us for the first time, please consider subscribing, whether it's at cnjradio.com, our YouTube channel, or on Apple Podcasts, or on Spotify. And also earlier, when I had shown the pictures of my latest edition of Killers, we do have an Instagram page, so you could find us on Instagram at IamVinylPete7628. So feel free to find me on there. And if you want to follow the page, I do post up when new episodes are released. Along with that, as always, I encourage you all to check out all of our other shows here at cnjradio.com. The Wrestling House Show, Rock Strikes 10, Talking Rock, The Synaptic Empire, and The Last Theater. That's going to be it for me here. Once again, with the latest KISS Roundtable discussion. We will try to be back as soon as possible. 
with part seven, which will be focused on their 1983 album, Lick It Up. And of course, as many KISS fans are very well aware by this point, this is when they would remove their makeup and move into a whole new era and a string of albums while not wearing makeup. So the next part will be the beginning of those albums as we've come to the end and we didn't mention it in the roundtable discussion, but we have come to the end at this point of Kiss's career of their albums in makeup from 1974 through 1982. Again, that's going to do it for me here. And on behalf of the roundtable, which I thank them once again for joining me, we all thank you for joining us here at the I Am Vinyl podcast, once again, here at cnjradio.com. Thank <laughs> you.